The birth of modern painting most likely took place in France in the second half of the 19th century and in the early 20th century, under the impetus of the modern era brought forth by the Industrial Revolution and the liberalization of customs. Behind the various appellations, such as Impressionism, Pointillism, Post-Impressionism, Fauvism, Cubism, Surrealism, and Abstract Art, the artist became more than a witness. He became an actor, even a media of modern society. The works of these visionary painters who shape the essence of modern painting are today among the most prized on the market. This documentary series presents an overview of the various actors of these different movements. The term First School of Paris designates the group of foreign artists like Soutine, Van Dongen, and Mogdigliani who arrive in the capital at the dawn of the 20th century, seeking favorable conditions for their art. They know the great French masters of Impressionism. In their 20s, for the most part, they participate in the social and intellectual awakening in Europe, characterized by political engagement and a loss of religion. Amedeo Modigliani was born in Italy in 1884. The fourth son of a ruined businessman, his poor childhood is marked by sickness. After having studied his classics in Italy, he came to Paris when he was 22. While this is a fertile artistic period with Fauvism, Cubism, and Surrealism in particular, the young painter does not want to be classified in any of these movements that define limits. He remains unclassifiable, obstinately insisting on his difference. And this is also when he begins to construct a persona and cultivate his reputation as a hopeless abuser of drugs and alcohol a kind of prince of the vagabonds. A painter of nudes and portraits who also made sculptures and drawings, he chose his models from amongst his friends, in the cafes of Montparnasse, or from the common people in the streets. He has his own unique mastery of color. His painting seeks an occasionally religious ideal in his portraits, where the focus resembles masks whose forms are elongated. Here you see this extreme oval shape, which almost corresponds to a cathedral's mandalas in its shape, and this oval appears in several components. When you look at this large portrait by Modigliani, you see a rather stylized form, where the oval is reproduced both in the face and the bust, and even for part of the knees of this woman in the pink blouse. There are also the colors, a somewhat reduced palette with grays and pinks, which you'll also find in certain paintings by Picasso and Braque from the same era. Nevertheless, Modigliani will impose a background that is no more than suggested, like lots of paintings created during the War of 14. Instead, he works with lines that are quite geometric and suggests an interior that would be rather modest. Amadeo Modigliani is an artist who is somewhat outside the history of the 20th century and the history of modern art. He was born at the end of the 19th century, 
just one year after Picasso. It's interesting to put it in a chronological perspective, but he dies much younger, suffering from a pulmonary sickness since his childhood. He dies in 1920 at 36 years old, which is very young. In 1906, at 22 years old, the young painter leaves his native Italy to come to Paris, where everything is happening as far as painting is concerned. It is a period when Paris is in the center of the art world, and any artist who is interested in the avant-garde or modernity will want to go to Paris at some point in their career. Modigliani is no exception to the rule and decides, with his family's money, to leave for Paris. He arrives there in 1906. It is a particularly important date in the history of the avant-garde, as it is one year after the explosion of the Forbes in the Autumn Salon. So there has already been a first avant-garde movement there, greatly shook the world of painting and caused it to react. And it is precisely the Forbes with Van Dogen who splashed the visitor with a very colourful style of painting, and above all with colours that don't correspond to nature. The colours do not resemble reality. The canvas becomes something like a pot of paint thrown in the face of the public. Modigliani arrives in this period. It is also the period where Cezanne retrospective will be organized in 1907. This retrospective will have a huge impact on the artists, in particular Pablo Picasso and others who will later become the heart of the Cubist movement. 1906 is also one year before Gauguin, the master of primitivism, has a major retrospective as well. This is the artist who distanced himself from Western culture, going to Tahiti to look for the source of a new, naive culture, one that was supposed to regenerate the art of painting. So, he arrives at quite an incredible artistic turning point, and this very sensitive young man is immediately integrated into the circles of the Parisian avant-garde. He is caught up in all of this sensitivity. He then moves to Montmartre and meets young artists like Cocteau and Picasso, with whom he becomes friends. Another striking characteristic of Modigliani is that you can never place him within a movement. I have just cited a certain number of them for you, the Forbes, the Cubists, Cézanne, Gauguin, but Modigliani is a man who will remain apart. Yet you can't say that he is broken from all of these currents. He feels them. He lives them. He experiments with them. These new movements interest him, but he always leaves them a little to the side. Why? That will remain a mystery. Maybe it's because he had this classical Italian culture, this interest in the art of the Renaissance, and all this Western culture that he didn't want to reject outright. He constantly strives to form a kind of synthesis. He tries to find his own path and his own style. The consequence of this path, which is quite rare in the period of the 20th century, is that any of you who likes paintings can tell you, yes, that's a Modigliani. So much so that his fame is quite considerable, possibly because his painting is basically thought to be easily understood. Seductive, sensual and beautiful. He has this considerable fame, but is limited by two points. First, he is considered a classicist and refused the status of a modern or avant-garde artist, which has greatly limited his reputation in the history of art. And the traces that he was able to leave are much smaller than those of Picasso or Matisse. His other problem is that his style is thought to be just one thing that can be immediately recognized. Because he is a much more complex artist, 
He deserves a much closer interest in relation to his career, which we need to examine. His career is very brief, from 1906 to 1920, 14 years. That's really very short. But we can make divisions in his creative output, which is all of the same rather large. There are several thousand of Modiglianini's painting in the world. We can cut this output into large periods to go a bit further than the impression we have all of knowing everything and being rather familiar with it. In the first works created in his miserable studio, he's inspired by the fashionable painters of the time, like Toulouse-Lautrec and Cézanne, and straightaway shows his preferred theme, the portrait. Appropriating a Cézanne-esque construction of large chromatic masses, he begins to develop an extremely personal style characterized by these elongated or even deformed shapes, which let through a glimpse of something close to caricature. Despite their rather simple design, his portraits have a strong psychological charge and reveal a strange sense of drama. The style of the Modigliani you see here does not yet exactly resemble the Modigliani that we know. On one hand, the colors are very dull and dark, a little gray and bluish. When you look at this painting, you can think of Picasso's blue period, and that's probably a reference that makes sense. You also notice this contour line that is very different from the color that fills it. This contour line evokes newspaper drawings with something almost caricatural. The common woman depicted here does not have a hat, contrary to what you might think. It is her bun that sets her hair in this kind of undifferentiated mass on her head. This woman is in no way idealized. There are certain elements that interested artists in this domain of caricature, the exaggeration of traits and the separation of contour and color. What you can also see is that it is not very modeled, and in this it is already a work of the avant-garde. It is not at all a work that is made at the tradition of the 19th century would have it. When you look at it closely, there are different colors. A pink, a gray and a violet make it possible to distinguish the planes of the face. It's this very heavy emphasis on the gaze that gives the portrait its power. In this we see what will be an essential preoccupation for Modigliani in his career, which is both the encounter with a person and at the same time the importance of style. In this portrait, which I always found very beautiful, there is this encounter with an individual. The two eyes are treated in a somewhat irregular manner, as are the two sides of the face as well. There are differences of colour that give life to the face and make it so that this woman, even though she is roughly sketched and the colours are not very realistic, is there, before us, and her eyes are looking at us. This is also accentuated by the fact that here, we always hung the painting at eye level, when it makes it so the encounter is even more possible. She is really placed at my level, and this heavy gaze that you can see already full of painful experience stares at me and creates this encounter. You can already tell that Modigliani had seen a lot of things. He was steeped in this expressionistic and pictorial ambience of Paris in the beginning of the century, but took something of his own from it, even if this is not yet the Modigliani that we know. In 1909, after a short return to Italy and some exhibitions, Modigliani decides to dedicate himself to sculpture. Then he leaves Montmartre and moves his studio to the Montparnasse neighborhood. For four years, the painter was sculpted. He works with limestone, then with marble. He even returns once again to Italy to live near a quarry, 
Thanks to his discovery of African and Cambodian art, here you see the birth of his elongated faces, which will quite quickly become the artist's signature, the expression of his feelings. The second period represents a great break in the work of Modigliani. Through another artist, he asked to meet Broncusi, the great sculptor of Romanian origin, who invented a modern sculpture, a new sculpture for the 20th century, starting from the style of Auguste Rodin. A member of the School of Paris, and thus a foreigner in Paris, he had already attained a considerable fame and an aura in the circles of the artistic avant-garde. He asked to meet him because he is fascinated by a Broncusi sculpted works. After this encounter, there is a period in Modigliani's oeuvre where there are only drawings and sculptures. Working in stone and marble exclusively, he no longer paints and drawing is treated exactly as though it was sculpture. During this period, that is very intense and very concentrated in time, Modigliani investigates and is only particularly interested in one kind of sculpture, what we call directly carving. This is not a model sculpture, or bronze, or plaster, or clay, that is then moulded in bronze, but direct carving. Starting from a block, you extract a shape by using blunt or sharp objects to extract a form from the mass. His rare and limited but very passionate sculptures are one of the important pages of what we call a kind of primitivism in sculpture that investigates eternal forms in a way. This is a time where we discover a certain form of Greek archaism. There is a fascination with the idols of Cyclades, for example, and certainly Modigliani's return to direct carving in stone and marble is part of this movement. After the great years of Rodin, there is a return to these much more physical practices in sculpture. And Modigliani will write a very important page in the history of sculpture, very short and intense, but precious. Here we have an unfinished sculpture. It allows us to see the stages of Modigliani's work and to understand what he meant by this figure that he extracted from the material. All of Modigliani's other sculptures are in different types of stone. This is the only one in marble. You can see easily see the shape of the block by the way the base was dug here because the block continues lower than the sculpture that he started to carve out. He recreates inside of this block a kind of second base. And little by little, he makes a face emerge, extremely symmetrical and very simplified, which evokes an African mask. There are also lots of very diverse influences, Egyptian or other, that are tied to a certain idea of primitive sculpture. The idea is to summarize the face in its simplest components. The bridge of the nose, the two ovals of the eyes, and the oval of the face, so that everything creates a sort of perfect symmetry. There is really this idea of reconstituting an idea of the face. There are these two half circles that cross in a mandola, an accentuated bridge of the nose that is clearly not naturalistic. The mouth appears as a ridge, the same as the nose, and even the forehead is made of a ridge, while the two almond-like eyes take shape in a manner that is also perfectly symmetrical. What is rather beautiful is that you see how he worked. He breaks away large masses with a gauge, and then he sculpts and erases any trace of the gauge to smooth out the stone or marble, and reaches the form of perfection that is very simple, both modern and timeless.
Modigliani, with his talent, manages to exhibit his works in Paris, but in 1914, his poor health abruptly forces him to abandon this path. The dust and exhaustion will force him to dedicate himself uniquely to painting. He then creates portraits of the regulars of Montparnasse, like Soutine, who drinks like a fish, Max Jacob, Blaise Sandrard, Fujita, and Jean Cocteau, amongst others. His output becomes more sure, more intense and serene, but his style is still maturing. Here we have a portrait of a very important artist from the School of Paris, Maurice Kisling. He is a Jewish Lithuanian artist who, like many others, came to Paris in the 1910s. Modigliani will get close to this circle of foreign artists in Paris and pay homage to them by depicting them. What is striking is that in the year 1914-1915, he studied, perhaps more intensely than before, Picasso's Cubist productions. You can maybe see it even better in this painting, where there is a very angular dimension to the face, and work on hatching that shows an attempt at experimentation around the form. In other paintings, you often see the name of the model written in letters, which is also an influence from Cubism. Sometimes, you also have this effect, either of flattening or of multiplicity of points of view, which is another mark of Cubism. This is a time when he is looking into the avant-garde. He distances himself from the influence of Brancusi and seeks a new path for his style. Although the line is not yet refined, the arrangement of the colors is now well established in the formulation of his portraits, which truly lay bare the personality of the person he depicts. When you think of Modigliani, it is always a model in an interior. The interior is merely alluded to by a few architectural elements. This is the case here. It's just enough to understand that we are in a room, in an enclosed space, but there is virtually never an opening to the exterior. Here, shockingly, there is this window that opens onto something else but it's a somewhere else that is totally indiscernible. When I see this window, I immediately think of Matisse. These are also the years when Matisse makes his magnificent window paintings. Very abstract, where is a window that opens onto an extremely flat landscape, made with flat areas of colour, or even a window that opens onto nothing. I think there is really a reference to Matisse, first of all with this luminosity, this work on the blues and whites, and then this somewhat arabesque dimension, taking shape around the window in the background. You really sense a Modigliani, who reopens himself to new things, to new influences, and in a way digests and absorbs them. You can also see something that will develop in his classic period and is already being worked on here, the attention to colour. We saw the painting from 1908, a little pale, very blue, where the question of colour was still quite underground. During the sculpture period there is virtually no colour, and here, all of a sudden, colour arrives, a brilliant colour. It's the colour of the jacket, with its almost peasant shape, and the stature of this man sitting with his big hands resting on his knees. There is a really a very direct and purposefully sketched manner of working on the form. But, at the same time, there is a finesse, a subtlety in the play of colours, with this very focused balance between a brilliant blue and an orange-brown shade. As you know, 
something that greatly interested the artist of modernity was what we call complementary colours. There, what we have is precisely a play between complementary colours, blue and orange. It's not about returning to a naturalistic colour here. The idea is not to depict the man as he truly is. The idea is to use reality in such a way to lead it towards art, with precisely this idea of smoothing it, simplifying it, and at the same time intensifying it through painting. It's at this time that Modigliani once and for all begins to use the ovals that so characterize his work. Once again, you have the mandola I spoke to you about from the sculpture, but this time it's the entire body that forms this very symmetrical arm and shape. Something upsets this very stable symmetry, which is quite classic in the end, giving this portrait a present that is little traditional in a way. With the format and the stature of a traditional portrait, it's the face that is different. You see the influence of cubism and its facets, where the eyes are not only simplified, but are two different sizes and have slightly different expressions. The slightly twisted character of the nose, which is real in Kisling's case, by the way, he actually had a bent nose, is accentuated at the same time as it is simplified. As for the haircut, it used to create a form that's very sculptural in a way, which strongly evokes primitive sculpture. You see how all his influences of colour, sculpture, form and contour come together with this reality of Kisling in his painting. It's done to make something where art and reality grapple with each other, but in a very satisfying and beautiful way. For me, it is one of Modigliani's masterpieces. It is only different from his final period, which we will talk about next, in that there is still a very experimental side, where elegance is less important than it will become later. Here, it's something much more raw and more daring in a way. Never again would he include this window, nor would he go so far in his quite brutal treatment of the hands. All this is done in a transition between the avant-garde and something much more classical. While the painter now sells his paintings, he will nevertheless continue his efforts to improve his technique in order to portray the feelings that he perceives in his models. What you can clearly see when you look through his catalogue is that he draws a lot, especially in the period of 1915 to 1916. As soon as he is on the terrace of a cafe, he draws. For him, it's the exercise of a portraitist. That is, how do I look at reality, capture its essence, simplify it and sketch it quickly within the principles of my own style? He has an enormous output of drawings. They are not very beautiful drawings in the sense that they are not very polished. There are no relief efforts. There is no work on light and shadow. They are very raw with rather thin pencil strokes. It is really a work that seems slightly banal, but is interesting in the sense that it is really a laboratory of style and portraiture. He is someone who draws directly on the canvas and then colours it. The contours are really meant to reproduce the rapidity of these drawings and sketches. There are hundreds of portraits that he will make during this period. These are not portraits of just anyone. He chooses people from the Parisian avant-garde. It is quite an interesting moment, because this is the work of a portraitist, but it becomes complicated when you are an artist of the avant-garde. 
How does one connect style and the imperative of style with resemblance? The person is there. He must convey something from this person into the portrait. How do you connect the two? It is very interesting and makes it possible to put together a gallery of very truthful portraits, not at all idealized. You have all the avant-garde artists Paris had to offer, not only painters, sculptors and drawers, but also actors and composers. Modigliani will make portraits of all kinds of people. Beneath these brushstrokes, an entire gallery is born, made of celebrities or simply romantic conquests and friends. So, he is a painter who paints the world around him, like all the artists of this period. Modigliani's work is literally iconic, in the sense of working on an icon, where there is a simplification of forms, almost a disappearance. There is also a shaping of features according to a very precise code. The shape of the eyes in particular, with this very emptied way of depicting the gaze, and their very simplified and synthetic shapes that you recognize immediately. These are the people who are around him at the time. They could be mistresses or his friends. It's a circle of close friends. As was often the case in the avant-garde since the second half of the 19th century, you have the complicity of poets, writers and critics who support the artist. There are also patrons who support them as well as galleries that exhibit their works. Amongst the portraits of his close friends, there is one Paul Guillaume, who is a dealer and collector of modern art, and thanks to whom Modigliani sells his paintings. Paul Guillaume will accompany him for almost two years, which may seem short, but these are two decisive years in the middle of the First World War. Notably, it's Paul Guillaume who will persuade him to stop his sculpture practice and return to painting, with a stylistic and formal quest that is very unique to Modigliani. This gives us these figures that are immediately recognizable and make Modigliani a great success in the art market today. He is an artist who is highly rated today. At the Orangerie Museum, we are lucky to have five paintings, which is already a lovely collection for Modigliani. We have a very important painting, which is a portrait of Paul Guillaume as Novo Pilota, as pilot of this new golden age, for the avant-garde of the era. There again is a very direct homage by Modigliani to his patron and dealer. After all these years of research, the painter's style finally settles and becomes a clear sign of recognition in the world of modern painting. And all the strength and talent of Modigliani will surely be in bringing classical painting into modernism. For art historians, the period from 1917 to 1919, the last three years of his life, is called the classic period because in it he is able to make a synthesis. We are before a painting from that period. In it there's a kind of synthesis of all his influences, sculpture, cubist painting, primitivism, drawing and colour. Everything is there. He ends up calming down, settling, and diluting his style to reach what we now call the style of Modigliani. It's a mixture of many things that he will maintain with variations, which you can analyse, continuing until his death in the beginning of 1920. Eaten away by absinthe, hashish and tuberculosis, Modigliani will move to the French Riviera with his companion, who is pregnant, to Nice in the south of France. In the southern light, the painter lightens his palette and works on larger formats. In the city of Nice, he will try to get as many people as possible to pose, with many more strangers in this period. 
You see portraits appear of the housekeeper's son and many children. For example, we have this portrait which is in Picasso's collection, which is a portrait of an absolutely charming young girl that he painted in Nice. So this is a period where he has mastered his art of portraiture and he tries to use it in all sorts of contexts, intimate portraits of a companion Jeanne or others. He will continue to make some portraits of notable people or friends who are close to him. For example, we have a portrait of Gaston Modot, who was a movie actor at the time, and another of the painter Sauvage, and his wife Germaine, who was a musician. You see all sorts of portraits of the people he rubbed shoulders with, as well as unknowns. You get the feeling that it doesn't make much difference to Modigliani. At the time, he tries to work on his portraiture as much as possible, to make progress in this dimension, with much more liberty. Once his style is fixed, you feel that his somewhat distraught questioning of what will I say, how will I say it, how do I master all these different things that have influenced me, is no longer the issue. He is the master of his oeuvre. Modigliani's paintings are now remarkable in the simplicity and sobriety of their lines and colours. His works convey a taste for rigorous and sober compositions. But despite this simplification, his portraits don't lose any character or expressiveness. Amadeo Modigliani painted nudes his entire life, but in the years 1916 and 1917, he makes his famous series that consist of 30 paintings. They show the models sitting, standing and reclining, idealized in their nudity. In 1917, he meets Zabrowski, who is the broke dealer of Polish origin who will take Modigliani's career in hand for a very brief period, as he dies shortly after. He advises him to make nudes and gets him a solo exhibition at the Bert Weil Gallery in 1917. Modigliani produces a series of nudes for this exhibition that would allow him to work much more on many things I could talk about. The influence of sculpture, the work on colour, the link between flatness and volume. At this moment in his career, a question that will grow in importance in the last years of his life will appear. The question of contour. This woman is not an identifiable person. It is a model who gives him, in a way, total freedom to work on the question of form, because the question of resemblance is much less important. He works on the question of the nude from the angle of rhythm. When you look at this figure, you realize that it is formed by a kind of uninterrupted curved line that is both very soft and very rhythmic, which makes it so that the body does not emerge through successive planes, or even through traditional perspective, but in relationship with this stunning line, which is quite abstract and clearly not very realistic. You have noticed that the two shoulders are not at the same level. One senses that he studied the painter Ingres, it's very clear in his paintings. You even have this rather classic three-quarter framing that meets the rhythm of the contour. There is also this fullness of the flesh, certainly made different than Ingres, but you can see this reference in it. This leads us to a painting that is at once very coherent, very dynamic, very sensual and very modern as a whole. He is always associated with this work, put into the face that resembles a mask from which any dimension of expressiveness has been removed. The eyes no longer have pupils, the nose is very simplified, the mouth as well. It's in a way the form that crowns the sensual fullness that is the body. When you look at this painting, you could also think of Picasso's The Young Ladies of Avignon. But with Picasso, 
There is a side that is much more angular and unsettling. There are hatch marks and planes that intersect, but you don't have them here as in this painting. There's a lot of work put into the idea of roundness, softness, femininity and sensuality. This exhibition will present, I don't know exactly how many paintings, but some 20 news, and it will cause a scandal. Why a scandal? The nude is part of the tradition of painting. There are already a lot of them, but because you don't see it very well in this painting, but he leaves the pubic hair visible. That was not done, and had never been done. It's the arrival of this very carnal, an animal character to the nude in painting that will cause a scandal. And in certain ways, this will mask the pictorial fullness he had reached. Everyone will concentrate on the scandal of these visible hairs and forget that in a certain way, he refers to the past masks of the nude and attempts to make, in his way, a sort of synthesis of all these influences. If these depictions evoke nothing mythological or historical, they nevertheless remain in the tradition of the nude Venus, which was a constant predominant motif in art from the Renaissance to the 19th century. After this exhibition, he will more or less abandon the question of the nude and return to portraits, but mostly portraits of women. Because it is also in these years, he will meet Jeanne Ebutin, who will be his last companion. She will be the companion with whom he will have the most peaceful relationship, compared to the many more termulous relationships he had in the past. Jeanne Ebutin will give him a daughter, who will also be called Jeanne, and will survive the two unfortunate parents. At the end of Mogilani's life, you see many more patriots of women, of different women for that matter. They are real portraits where you recognize the traits of the different models who interested them. There are an enormous amount of portraits of Jeanne, which really mark the end, the closure of Modigliani's oeuvre. Jeanne Ebutin is a painter herself. Modigliani nicknamed her Coconut because of her very white skin and slightly red hair. She was only 20 years old when she met the artist, whom she literally idolized. And they will very quickly have a child. Here we have a portrait of the little Jeanne and Jeanne Ebudin, the painter's companion. This painting dates from 1918, thus drawing Modigliani's final years of creation. His personal life stabilized with this woman, who was a painter herself, and made a certain number of paintings. They are able to find a kind of family that lives very modestly. He made many portraits of Jeanne, who had a lovely face, a Modigliani-style face, very fine, very distinguished, with a long neck that you see from portrait to portrait. He really works on this woman with child as a kind of traditional motif of maternity or the Madonna with child. This is what the very classical and peaceful character of this painting accentuates. But when you look a little closer, there is still this three-quarter cut. There is also this rather sophisticated way of creating the background in this painting as there are different places that clash with each other in a space that is not traditional, there is no vanishing point. There are these backgrounds, there are five of them, and it is not very clear how they go together with each other. But rather than being abstract with no relation to the model, they are almost there to emphasize the face and the shape even more where you have this idea of the arm and shape that structures the entire body. He always deliberately makes the shoulders nearly disappear. 
Any angular dimension of a woman's body is, in general, completely erased in this area. No matter what portraits he makes of women, he unites them around this idea of a very fluid and undulating body. They often have a tilted head, which is not the case here. And everything is made of interlocking shapes that are all equal and come together to fit inside each other, like a Russian doll. The young Jeanne is treated like a kind of doll herself, very simplified. You see once again what I tried to explain about the work put into the colours, which are very sophisticated. The entire background is in a shade of brown, but a brown that is sometimes red, sometimes pink, orange or green. It's really this idea that colours are unstable and that they can have a life to them, so that the background can live its life and thus bring more life to the model. You see the same shade of colours again, but more simplified. The shawl is green, the hair is red, the eyes are blue, the cheeks are orange. All these colours go admirably well together. They are built on an idea of colourful peace that is not the peace of reality. It is a reality that is completely reorganised by colour, in the same way that the body of this woman does not have the shape of a real body. It's a reality that's completely reorganised by contour. All this resembles a portrait that is both very modern and very much of its time, while also being highly classical, as it uses lots of the traditional codes of portraiture that go back to the 15th century. This tranquility, finally achieved in his painting, shows no sign of the tragic fate that lies ahead in the life of the artist, who is more and more sick. During his years in the city of Nice, they tried to heal him, but his lungs continued to get worse. And at the same time, you've seen a kind of great softness, a grand classicism, a richness in his works which gives you the feeling that he is at the dawn of a new period, rather than at the end of his career. During the winter of 1919, not having had any news, one of his friends goes to visit him and finds him delirious in bed, holding the hand of Jeanne, who is nine months pregnant, lying at his side. He dies shortly thereafter on the 24th of January, 1920. The next day, Jeanne throws herself from the fifth floor, bringing with her the second child. After his death, they discover the real misery in which the artist lived. Nobody could have imagined it because he had gained a certain notoriety through his physical prestige and the nobility of intellectual qualities which made him seem like a poet. Since then, he has been made into a legend, that of the cursed painter or the suffering artist, and has become one of the 20th century's greatest painters of women. In his paintings, Modigliani developed a certain number of stylistic criteria, like the highly accentuated line, the delimitation of surfaces, the elongation of the body, and eyes shaped like almonds. And despite their simplification and deformation, the portraits he made lost nothing of their character or expressivity. The art collectors were not mistaken because today, Modigliani is one of the highest rated painters on the art market. The works are dispersed throughout the world. They are greatly loved by private collectors, which is another characteristic of Modigliani. If you follow the news of the art market at the moment, there are lots of major works by Modigliani changing hands. 
which means that they leave one private collection and end up more often than not in another private collection. This is because the price the Mogliani's painting attained today does not permit the large part of museums to buy them. He is really a cherished, rare artist on the current market, who still attracts the major private collectors, which is interesting for the artists of the current generation. It is a rather interesting characteristic and is probably due to something highly characteristic and recognizable in Modigliani. If you have a Modigliani, you can tell immediately. And it's this effect of the recognition of a big name and also of an artist who has a bit of this halo of a cursed artist, an artist who dies young, tortured by alcohol and women. All these somewhat dark legends surrounding Modigliani are things that find an echo in the public and thus the market, even today.